نحمده و نسلي على رسول النبي الكريم نعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وسهبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله سب الله عليك وعلى وسلم Last week we were talking about tabarukat or those things or relics that are connected to those that Allah loves. Uh, and I'm going to connect that, you know, I mentioned this briefly last week as well, and I'm going to connect that with the Hajj, since today is the third of Zil Hajj. And Eid will be Friday, meaning the day of Arafah, which is the actual day of Hajj, will be Thursday. And we'll talk more about that later, inshallah. But, you know, we mentioned the verse, verse number 248 of Surah Baqarah, Surah number 2, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about Tabut al you know, this Ark, or what's known in English as the Ark of the Covenant. And Tabut in the Sakina meaning peace. He said, you know, He says in this verse, as we mentioned, I'm not going to go into the background of that again, but. When he mentions the tabut, he says tabut is seen to mir rabbi. In this box is peace or serenity from your Lord. And then he says, "Wa baqiyatum mimma taraka alu Musa wa alu Harun." And it has remnants from the belongings of the family of Musa alayhi salam and the family of Harun alayhi salam. So again, the emphasis here is not on the belongings of Musa and Harun السلام, but their families. Even though within the box there are the belongings of Musa and Harun as well. السلام. Now we know that within that box are the shoes, or the blessed shoes of Harun السلام, and various belongings of Musa. السلام. But again, the emphasis isn't on that. Because those things, you know, is. An example of this is like when the people came to Ali radiallahu, and they asked him to pray against the people of Sham you know, because you know, the civil war was going on and there was a war between the, the, the supporters of Ali radiallahu, and the supporters of Mavia who was in Sham. So the supporters of Ali came and they said pray against the people of Sham. So he said I will not because amongst them are 40 Abdad you know, Abdal, uh, from a real spiritual aspect, you can think of them as like the spiritual police. He didn't mention Sahaba. Even though amongst them were Sahaba Ikram, companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because, you know, he says they are Abdal, so if they're Abdal, you know, if he's not going to work, pray against them because of the presence of the Abdal, then the presence of the Sahaba is even greater than that. So he's bringing attention to this. Same where here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the belongings of Musa and Harun al-Islam themselves are very great. But he doesn't emphasize that, he emphasizes the belongings of their offspring. That even the belongings of the offspring are great. To the extent that because of their presence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I, this, this is the box of peace and serenity. And so as we mentioned last week, you know, if the belongings or if those things connected to the family of Musa and to the family of Harun are so great, 
then what about those things which are connected to the family of Rasulullah? <laughs> In the end, the final part of the verse, you know, and if you look at the layout of the Quran, you know, the way Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks to us in the Quran, you know, he'll make a statement, and then he'll he he will give a warning at the end of that statement. You know, he'll he'll say something, and then in the end he'll say like you know that Allah does not love the the uh, uh, those who uh, cause turmoil, you know, or or Allah loves those who are patient. And if you look before the whole verse, it, you know, the end, this is like the gist and the summarization of what came before it. The end of this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in lakum in kuntum mu'mineen. In this is a lesson for those who, who, you know, is a lesson for you if you are among the believers. In what? in honoring and respecting those things that are connected with the ones Allah SWT loves. Because that's what is contained within the box, within the ta'bud, are those things that are connected to those who Allah loves. And so Allah SWT says that in this, in honoring and respecting these things, and acknowledging their position, it is a sign for you if you truly believe. You know, if you flip that around, that means that if you don't honor and, the, and respect these things, then you're not amongst the believers. You know, and there are many, many other aspects of, of, of the verse, you know, and, and things connected. And some of those which we'll talk about on Eid, inshallah. Uh, and some I'm going to go over today as well. Now, so these are just relics, things left behind. And not just things left behind, but also belongings that were connected. You know, when, like when we talk about the blessed hair of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, or his nail, blessed nail clippings, or his blessed shoes, or, or anything that was connected to him. And those things still exist. But if you look at every form of worship in Islam, you know, who do we worship? Worship Allah alone. We don't worship anyone else other than Allah. But how we worship, you know, what we do during our worship, every form of worship in Islam is somehow connected to the ones Allah subhanahu wa loves. And Hajj is, is a prime example of this. You know, if you look at all of the arkan, all of the, the, the regulations and, and the uh, practices of Hajj, all of them are somehow connected to the ones that Allah subhanahu wa loves. And all of them, all of the, those are connected somehow to Rasulullah. <laughs> First thing you think about when you even think about Hajj is what? You think about the Kaaba? I mean, that's the first thing that comes to mind. When you enter Makkah, what's the first thing that you do? You go and you make tawaf. It's also the last thing you do before you leave. So you enter, you know, you enter the haram. The first thing that you do is you go, you make tawaf. And of course, how are you going to make tawaf? You walk in and the first thing you do is you see the Kaaba. And when you see the Kaaba, what does that remind you of? Who does that remind you of? It reminds you of Ibrahim al Islam and Ismail al Islam. Because they're the ones who built the Kaaba. <coughs> or rather, raised the foundations of the Kaaba. Because the foundations were there before. So they raised the foundations. And when you start thinking about them raising the foundations and you finally come to the point where they finish the completion of the Kaaba then you're reminded in the Qur'an that what did they do? They made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. رَبَّنَا وَوَاثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا 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 That, O oh Allah, send amongst them this great messenger. 
Who are they praying for? They were praying for Rasulullah. Rasulullah. And Rasulullah said what? He said to look upon the Kaaba is Ibadah. This is worship. All of these things are what? They are signs. Sha'ir Allah. Sha'ir Allah. These are the signs of Allah. What is the sign of Allah? Anything that you look upon it or you remember it and it reminds you of Allah. The whole universe is the sign of Allah. All of creation is the sign of Allah. But there are certain signs that are more, uh, I guess, better at reminding you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than other signs. And he refers to all of these things as his signs. And the greatest sign of Allah is, of course, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. You think about his greatness, you think about, about him, those who saw him. They were all in awe of him. You read any description of Rasulullah whether it's from Sayyidina Ali Karamallah Wajah or Abu Huraira or uh, Imam Hassan al Islam or Umm Ma'bud uh, radiallahu anha. Whoever described him, they all mention one thing. They say whoever saw him was in awe of him. You know, because they saw his beauty and his perfection. And when they realized that being so beautiful and so perfect he cannot be God then the one who is his creator is the only one who could be worshipped and so you look upon the Kaaba you're reminded of Ibrahim al -Islam and Ismail al -Islam, and eventually if you understand their sacrifice you're brought back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna safa wal marwata min sha'ayir Allah. That indeed safa and marwa are the signs of Allah. So what do you do? You make tawaf, you go around the Kaaba. You make two rakat in Maqam Ibrahim, and we'll come back to that one as well. But, but then, you know, what do you do after that? You go and you run between safa and marwa. Two hills. You know, they're referred to as mountains, because in reality they are mountains. But if you look at them from a worldly standpoint, they're hills. You know, it's not like they're, you know, they're not even 200 feet tall. You know, maybe 50 at the most. But when you're running between these two, who are you reminded of? <laughs> The mother of Ismail al Islam Bibi Hajra. Salam And what did he sh what did she do? You know, we know she ran between these two hills looking for food and water for who? For her son. Ismail al Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved that sacrifice of her so much that every person who comes for Hajj or for Umrah has to do that. And this is a form of ibadah, it's worship. But again, we're reminded of the sacrifice, you know, and, and the point, another point here is, you know, you can look at many sacrifices that many mothers have done. From an external standpoint, they look greater than the sacrifice of Bibi Hajar. Of course, everything is judged based on its intention on and on the iman because the intention is part of the Iman. And so from that standpoint, you know, her sacrifice outweighs the sacrifice of all these mothers. But there are mothers who have given their lives for their children. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not order us to follow into the footsteps of those mothers. But we are commanded to follow into the footsteps of Bibi Hajar. Where she walked, we walk, and where she ran quickly, we go quickly. You know, and places are marked. We still know where they were. Exactly as she moved, we are supposed to move. Why? Again, she's sacrificing for her 
she's she's looking for the benefit of her son who is not just any son you know this son happens to be a prophet and not just any prophet this is the prophet through whose lineage will come who Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so again that connection you know we making salat at maqam ibrahim again who are we reminded of ibrahim al islam which reminds us eventually of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know going to mina we come to mina and what do we do we sacrifice after the hajj and you know, after we've spent time the the day in arafat everybody comes back to mina you know we come to mina and you stone the jamarat you know those positions where uh, iblis or shaitan tried to deceive ibrahim alayhi salam <coughs> again we're we're reminded again of ibrahim alayhi salam we go and we sacrifice the animal we're reminded of the sacrifice of ibrahim alayhi salam where he lays the neck on or his knife on the neck of his son and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces that with the ram. And then he says in the Quran, وَتَرَكْنَا عَلَيْهِ فِي الْآخِرِينَ And we have postponed this for a later for later generations. Referring to the sacrifice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what was his great sacrifice? Everything was a sacrifice, but the one that were that is pointed to here is the sacrifice in Karbala of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. You know, Rasulullah knew what was going to happen after him. You know, and for those who have issues with that, you know, the hadiths are very clear on this. And even Nasiruddin al-Bani acknowledges those hadiths as say. You know, where Rasulullah knew that his grandson would be martyred in. Karbala. He doesn't tell him don't go. He doesn't tell him, you know, avoid the area or do this or do that. Why? Because he knew that this is a sacrifice that would give life to Islam again. Yeah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala postponed that with a great sacrifice, which was the sacrifice of so again, all of these things, you know, if we look at all of these forms of worship, you know, they're all connected to the Rasulullah Rasul in one way or the other. You know, when we're making, when we put on the ihram, and we're making tawaf, you know, of course, tawaf is the sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. But the way we make tawaf today, and the way we put on the ihram while we're making tawaf, you know, is not the sunnah of Ibrahim al -Islam. You know, Ibrahim al -Islam, when he made tawaf, he put the ihram on, both shoulders were covered. And he walked. For us, what is the order now? When we make tawaf, the right arm is exposed. And the first four circuits around the Kaaba, you know, we're supposed to walk firmly and fast. Why? Because in the seventh year of Hijri, you know, when the companions, when, you know, if you remember Sulaih Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, yes. you know, the Rasulullah and the companions had to go back to Medina Munawwara without making Umrah. But part of the agreement was that they would come back the next year. Quraysh would leave Mecca for three days. And the Muslims would be allowed to stay in Mecca for three days and make Tawaf and make Umrah. On their way to Mecca, the rumor was spread in, uh, in Mecca by Quraysh that, oh, you know, these people, they're so infamished or impoverished, you know, they're, they're starving to death and become so weak and they can barely walk and this and that. You know, because it's easy to attack an enemy that you think is weak. So Rasulullah he commanded the companions to show them, show the kuffar your strength. Open your arm and show them that you are not weak. And when you walk, when you make tawaf, you move firmly. 
to show that you that you know that you're not about to fall over dead to put fear in their hearts and so when the Quraysh they see this they started saying oh you know we were mistaken you know these guys these people they're moving like deer and so any plans they had made of attacking the Muslims now went away and this is a sunnah that we continue even today and the command is there so even when the Rasulullah came back for Hujjat al wida this is the way everybody made tawaf again the sunnah so we're making tawaf but we're reminded of when we even when we're putting on the ihram we're reminded of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when we make salat again we worship Allah and we worship no one except Allah but we cannot make salat without remembering Rasulullah <laughs> other than what we recite he commanded us to pray as you see me praying so when we stand you know if we're truly making salat when we stand we remember that we're standing like this because the Rasulullah system stood like this when we make ruku again we're making ruku to Allah we are worshiping Allah but there is no ruku without remembering that Rasulullah Sussam made a ruku like this the same thing when we make sujood <coughs> and every other aspect of salat so again the worship is for Allah but the connection is with the ones Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves You know, we talked about this even in, in Ramadan, fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyyama kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattakoon. That all you who believe fasting is ordained or prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before, before you. So that you may learn taqwa. But we don't fast like the previous nations fasted. And I'm not going to go into the details of, of that. No. But out of, you know, Rasulullah system is Rahmatulil Alameen. You know, previous nations, if they went to sleep after Maghrib, their fasting started. For us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left the whole night open. Fasting doesn't start until Suhur. Until the time for Fajr starts, that is when fasting starts. So we don't fast like they fasted. Why? Out of the mercy of Rahmatulil Alameen. Allah's mercy because of His mercy. Who is Rasulullah. And there's a whole history as to exactly what happened and why those later verses were revealed. But the initial order is fast like they fasted. And then when we come back to the Hajj, the actual part of the Hajj, Arafat, that is the Hajj. Rasulullah said that even if a man comes so close that he can throw a stone into Arafat. You know, he's been traveling for, for months or days and he gets there and he, he's late and before the sun sets on the day of Arafat, even if he can throw a stone into, into Arafat from where he is, his Hajj is accepted. Again, Rahmatulil Alameen. But what does Arafat remind us of? Arafat itself, the word Arafat means what? To remind. It is a reminding to remember, to recognize. So what are we supposed to recognize there? And again, you have to go back to the history. If you look at the history of Arafat, what happened in Arafat that was so significant? And why is there a small hill in Arafat or a mountain called Jabal Rahmah, the mountain of mercy? What happened so that it was given that name? This is the place where Adam salam and his wife Bibi Hawa, our mother, Bibi Hawa they, they, after being sent to the earth, 
from, from paradise. This is where they finally met. And it was on Jabal al-Rahma when the, when the repentance of Adam al-Islam was finally accepted. You know, for 300 years he had been saying, Rabbana adhalamna anfusana wa illam tawfil lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al-khasreen. That, O oh, our Lord. Both of them were saying this. O oh, our Lord, if you do not, uh, that we have wronged, O oh, our Lord, we have wronged our own souls, ourselves. And if you are not forgiving and merciful, then we will be destroyed. We are lost. And so, <coughs> but they had been making this dua for 300 years. No response until finally on Jabal Rahman. When Adam al Islam he makes this dua with the wasila of Rasulullah. <laughs> finally the acceptance comes. So again, even in Hajj, on the main part of the Hajj, the actual Hajj, again we are worshipping Allah and we're making dua and supplication to Allah, but we cannot forget Rasulullah. <laughs> so the connection with the ones that he loves and those who are connected to Rasulullah. You know, if we forget that then we have forgotten ourselves and we have forgotten our religion completely. And this is the condition that we're in today. And as, uh, we worship Allah alone. But again, we cannot forget the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And if we forget them, then our worship has no meaning. It, it is not worship. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created that connection, you know, He created worship with that connection, and we take that connection away, then there is no worship. Again, Eid will be Friday, inshallah. I mean, and I'll say a few words after Salat as well, but for right now, Eid will be Friday, 8.30. Uh, I'll try to be here on time. Uh, the Eid will be Jummah, uh, and Jummah still is Jummah. So Eid is Eid, but Jummah is Jummah. So, you know, there is this concept among some people that, oh, if Eid falls on Jummah, then there's no Jummah. But, you know, Omar Radiyan clarified that during his Khilafah because there were some people who were leaving and he said, no, or not with no intention of coming back and he said, no, you've got to come back. Because Rasulullah says, when he told those people that they did not have to come back, those were people who had traveled from outside, so Juma wasn't an obligation on them anyway. So those were the people who were allowed to go back to their homes without having coming to come back for Juma, uh, which, you know, pretty much for everybody here doesn't qualify. Uh, you know, so, Inshallah, I'll break here, and uh, there are certain ibadah that should be done, and I'll talk about those after Salat, Inshallah. But uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and uh, fill our hearts with His true love and the true love of His beloved Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, His family, His companions, and all those whom they love. Uh, those who have not made sunnah, go and make sunnah, Inshallah.